So I don't know if you guys know this about me or not, but in case you don't, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, all right? I love going to the movies. I like the movies a lot. I like to go to the movie theater and watch movies, and yet I rarely get to go to the movies. Uh, it's that whole, you know, four kids, uh, no money, no time, all of that kind of stuff, right? Um, so often when I see a new movie, I see it at Lynn and Waddell's house uh, because... <laughs> Because about once a month, my family and I, we go over to Lynn and Wydell's and we, uh, we watch movies over there with them as a family, and it's, it's great. I mean, they have the popcorn, and they got the candy, and they got reclining seats. It's the whole shebang. It's pretty awesome. Uh, but uh, this past weekend, last Saturday, my wife actually took me out on a special date, and we went to the movies. We went out to see a movie. Praise God. And, um, and so... Uh, it just so happened my mom was in town, and so she could take our kids, and so we got out. And it's a really special thing, because my wife doesn't like the movies. Uh, like, the first date that we went on in college was to the movies, and she fell asleep. And uh, that, was, that, was kind of a, that was kind of the beginning of her going, I don't really want to waste $8 to fall and take a nap, uh, you know. So anyway, so we don't go to the movies very often, but this particular night, we went and saw the newest installment of Mission Impossible. Mission Impossible 7. Yes, it's a, uh, oh, oh, yeah, I give you a Tim Allen grunt when I say it. It's just so good. Uh, anyway, we got there before the movie started, and, and as the movie was getting ready to start, Tom Cruise, the director, come on screen, and they tell us, you know, we hope that you really, we made this movie for you, we hope you really, really enjoy it. Uh, enjoy uh, Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. And I said, Part 1? Uh, um. <laughs> so I didn't know that it was only Part 1, but I, it's okay. I've made this mistake before. Uh, and when I was in high school, I went and saw The Hobbit uh, with, three, <laughs> with three of my closest friends. And, and the movie ended, and the credits rolled, and I was sitting there, and I just burst out loud, literally burst out loud, what? How can a movie end like that? And like so many people in the theater heard me, and they laughed because, you know, they're Lord of the Rings nerds, and uh, they've read all the books, you know, and they put posters on their walls, all this stuff. Uh, anyway, I don't do that, and they laughed at me, and my friends looked at me, and they called me a moron, and that's fair. Um, but... <laughs> But I, I was a little bit bothered. I was a little bit upset because there was no resolution, right? And at least this time, I knew there wasn't going to be a resolution because Tom Cruise came on screen and told me. And I was, I was very grateful for Tom uh, in that moment. <laughs> I did not want to be surprised again. Uh, and, uh, and Jesus today uh, is going to tell us a story, and it comes to a resolution. I like my resolutions to be really happy endings, right? Anybody else? Uh, has, anybody, has anybody seen... Um, Oh, what is that? It's it's a it's a movie. It's on Netflix. It's got the guy who played Flash on the WB show. Anyway, he's like a K nine police officer, and he like trains this you know this this dog named Ruby how to be a K nine dog. We watched that as a family on Friday night, and I cried. I was just like, man, this is so such a good ending. Like it was a good ending that that little boy got found at the end of the movie. But then that that little boy was the shelter. Like the shelter woman's son who like wanted a Ruby to get adopted. I mean, it was just amazing. Okay, anyway. <laughs> That's the kind of resolution I want, people. You know what I mean? Jesus tells a story today, and the resolution is not nearly as happy. It's not a, it's not a happy ending. So um, we're going to read it. Uh, but uh, but I'm, I'm going to warn you ahead of time. As the story comes to a close, it's not a... It's not a happy ending. So we're going we're gonna to read together. It's in Mark chapter 12. If you turn your Bibles over to Mark chapter 12, we're going to be uh, right there, starting right at the top of the chapter in verse 1. We're going to read through verse 12. Uh, this is a parable and a story from Jesus. It says, Jesus began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenant to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them, and they struck this man 
on the head and treated him shamefully. He still sent another, and that one they killed. He sent many others, some they beat, others they killed. He had one left to send, a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, they will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him, and they killed him, and they threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read this passage of Scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Then the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away. Now, to understand this parable... Uh, you have to understand a little bit of the Old Testament, uh, and it's specifically Isaiah chapter 5. So if you have your Bible, flip to Isaiah chapter 5, please. Uh, the words are not going to be on the screen, so we're going to get familiar with our Bibles right now, all right? So start from Mark and go back toward the beginning, um, and Isaiah is going to be toward the, begin, or the end of the Old Testament. So you're going to go uh, back, kind of, it'll, it'll be almost halfway Um, in your Bible, but Isaiah chapter 5, and we're going to hear something very similar to this story that Jesus tells. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1, Isaiah says this, I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of all of its stones and planted its choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it. And cut out a wine press as well. Does that sound like the story Jesus is telling? Okay. Then he took, uh, or then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and the people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I had have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now, I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will, I will take away its hedge, and it will be destroyed. I will break down its walls, and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. So the point of Jesus' story is to say that God loved Israel so much. He loved his people so much. And he did everything he could do in his power to make them fruitful and beautiful and a great people and a great nation. And yet they rejected him. And like the servants Jesus refers to in the story, God sent prophet after prophet to speak to the people throughout the Old Testament. To call them to repent and turn back to God. Prophets spoke to people about what was going to happen if they didn't choose to do what God had called them to do. But like the servants in Jesus' story, these prophets are ignored They're rejected, they're beaten, and some even killed. And now it is when this story takes its final turn. The vineyard owner sends his son to do the job of a prophet. He sends his son to call the people into repentance, to turn away from their wayward lives because the kingdom of God is here. Specifically, those chief priests are who Jesus is talking to. Those that God had entrusted uh, with the leadership of his people. The chief priests and the teachers of law were seen to be the shepherds and to lead God's people well, and yet they had been corrupted. 
Every time a, a superpower would come in, like Assyria or, or, or Babylon or the Romans, they would come in, and, and many of the, the chief priests and the leaders of Israel, they would, they would just end up moving over to the other side because they would promise them ease of life. They would promise them good things. They would promise them riches and prosperity. And so the people who were, who were called to actually shepherd the people of God in a good way were corrupted by their own desires for power and their own desire for prestige as opposed to the will of God. And they are the ones, they are the ones that Jesus is speaking to in this story. And these are the ones that will bring Jesus to the Romans and demand that he be crucified. They are the ones who will kill the son sent to call them to repent and do the will of God. Now, I think this is a really beautifully told story, if you know all of that stuff. It's a really beautiful story that helps us understand what Jesus is trying to do here, and yet it's not a story with a happy ending. It's a tragic story. It's a story where the immense love of God for his people is taken for granted, and it's pushed to the wayside. It's a story where something that could have been great, something that could have, have been amazing if the tenants would have done the will of the, the vineyard owner, but they didn't. It's a story of hard hearts who refuse to listen to the word of God, spoken by those who are on mission to bring them back to the Father. It's a story of the murderous death of God's own son because he became a stumbling block of offense. They rejected the stone that was chosen and chose to build a different structure on a different foundation. But what those chief priests didn't know was the way God was going to bring down their kingdom was by building up another one on the very death they brought to pass. Very soon after this, Jesus is going to go to the cross. Very soon after he tells this parable, he's going to go to the cross and he's going to be killed. The son will die. And it will be a tragedy. Or so everyone thinks. When Jesus died, it was like this story that Jesus tells of the tenant farmers. Everything ends in his death. His disciples and family are broken hearted. His closest friends are getting back to their day jobs. They kind of forget about the whole kingdom of God thing. They, they can't stop thinking about Jesus, though. They can't stop thinking about the way that he taught and the way that he, he walked through life. The, the faces of people that would light up when he would heal someone or when he would raise someone from the dead. The memories were great, but Jesus was still dead. That is until Jesus finishes telling part one of the story. See, this parable was deemed a tragedy, but it's only the beginning of part one of the story. At the end of part one of the story, Jesus comes back to life. Three days after being murdered, killed on a cross, and buried in a tomb, Jesus comes back to life. The stone is rolled away. What was thought to be a tragedy, the story that, 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 um, that, that seemed to be resolved in the death of God's son has become a joyous ending for all who hear. Christ crucified, buried, and raised. That's the gospel. That's the good news. That, that's the happy ending to part one. In part two, it begins with God breaking down the old vineyard and starting to build a new one with a new people a new diverse people, not just the kingdom of Israel, but all nations of the world as eyewitnesses of Jesus, his life and his resurrection, go out into all nations proclaiming the good news, baptizing people in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. This kingdom begins to take shape here on earth as it is in heaven. People are joining together in homes. They're eating together. They're remembering the death of Christ and the fact that his body broken, his blood shed are what unite them. And it makes for this amazing and glorious family and a revolutionary movement we call the church. 
And part two, two of the story is still playing out. It's still working itself out in us. And there's a lot of progress that's been made, but, but there's also been a large shift, especially in the West over the last 60 years. The once vibrant and beautiful vineyard of God is being challenged like it's never been challenged before. And the church now more than ever now more than ever, may very well have to embrace a prophetic work and and hold to a prophetic voice in order to help the world see the hope of the gospel and call people into repentance and following Christ. If repentance from our own ideologies and our own ways of doing things our own systems and processes, what we think justice looks like and righteousness looks like, can't change and we can't repent and turn away from those things to be more like the family of God that we are called to be, we may end up trampled underfoot and we may not be as good of tenants as we should be. If repentance, though, can become the mark and the message of our lives and our generation and the future generations to come, I truly believe God will do something that he's always promised to do. He will turn our hearts of stone into hearts of flesh, and he will make valleys of dry bones come to life and be living people again. Maybe you came here today and your heart, your heart is hard toward the church, maybe your heart is hard toward change, toward doing anything different, maybe you're being resistant to even giving God control of your life because it feels safer as long as you have control of all the pieces and parts, I want to call you to repent. (laughs) Turn away from that. You need to lay that down because all that is is an idea that you can be your own God. And I promise you, you can't be. You make a lousy God. And my guess is your life is evidence of it. But also, you may have came in here just feeling kind of dead and dry, weary. And you just want to be brought back to life again. And the answer is not to continue going in the direction you're going, but it's to turn, it's to repent, it's to come back to the Father, come back to the Son, and be filled with His Spirit. Let Him breathe life into your dry bones. Because if you come to Him, He will do so. I think this is what Jesus is talking about in Matthew chapter 11 when He says, come to me. You're weary, heavy laden. I'll give you rest. I'm going to give you a life of the easy yoke. That's what he says. My yoke is easy. I think this is what he's talking about. But we first have to come to him. We have to turn. Come to him. And he will restore our soul. But there are also those of us who are committed members of the church and the the community of Christ. We're we're a part of this remnant of faith in the world, right? The minority of people in our culture. And I want you to know that (laughs) this prophetic place that I think that we are called to stand in, in case you don't know, it will likely be met with a lot of opposition, Much like Jesus himself, the prophets of old, we cannot expect that a prophetic work or a prophetic word will lead to a happy ending for us. However, we should expect and we should know that no matter what the cost, if the good news is shared and if the good news is received, it is good. No matter what it might cost us or no matter what might happen to us. Because that will be our treasure in heaven, in which we can store up where moth and rust will not destroy.
Next week, we're going to start a two-part series called Cultural Moment. And um, the idea behind it is to look at the cultural moment that we have today and try and say, how do we get here? But also, how do we live and be salt and light in this cultural moment? How do we be a, a group of people committed to this prophetic word and prophetic work. This story has not resolved itself yet. Part two of this story, though, has been written, and we know how it ends. It ends much like part one with Jesus coming back. And it will end with the vineyard owner coming to collect. He will come to collect. He will separate the good from the bad. And he will lay waste to the bat. So let us know, let us know that we should not grow weary of doing good. For in its proper season, there will be a harvest that the, that the vineyard owner is coming to collect. And so let us, as the church, as the people of God, as the tenants of his vineyard, steward that well. Manage that well. Lead that well so that we might not be laid waste. He's already come to declare hope in his love and in his grace. May we respond and be good servants. Do as he has called us to do and steward his vineyard well. No matter where you find yourself when you come in here today, I just I want to challenge you. If you're somebody who, man, like I just, I need the good news of Jesus over my life. Maybe you're dealing with some of the things that, you know, we talked about in that, that song we sung just before I came up here. Maybe you're dealing with depression and anxiety and fear. Maybe you're dealing with addiction. Maybe there's a stronghold in your life. And you're trying so hard to deal with it all, but I'm telling you, turn, <laughs> repent, come to Jesus. He will help. He will be your strength when you are weak. Maybe you are one of those people who just, you're... <laughs> You're weary, you're worn out, you're dry. Come to Jesus. Let him restore your soul. Breathe life into your bones. No matter who you are, I just want to challenge you as we respond and we take communion, we remember this gospel. The body broken, the blood shed, the son's death. I want, to, I want to just challenge you to respond however you feel led. I'll be right up front if you want to respond. Uh, there will also be people in the back who can respond and, and those kinds of things. We also uh, we have a room upstairs. It's kind of private now, praise God. Um, and uh, so if you want to make a decision, have a conversation about something, we have uh, someone will be standing at these back double doors right here, and they'll be happy to walk with you right upstairs. You guys can go sit in a quiet room and talk about uh, the decision that you feel like God's laid on your heart to make. Um, I want to encourage you to do that as we, as we take communion today, as we rise and as we make our way to the table. Um, you can also respond in those ways. If you want prayer, whatever it is, we want to meet you, want to be there with you, and uh, we want to encourage you and remind you that praise God. Praise God that Jesus Christ loved us so much that he gave his son, whom he loved and, and who he wanted, he gave him for us. May we not miss that. May we not miss the son who's come. And miss his love and his grace given to us through the cross.
I'm going to pray, and then uh, whenever you feel led after I pray, you can respond and take communion. Let's pray. God, thank you for today. Thank you for just the opportunity that we have to be here and to um, share in this, this truth that you have come, the Son has come, that you have died. That your body was broken and your blood was shed so that we could have new life, so that we could start and build a new future and a new hope. God, we are so grateful that we have been washed clean by your blood. That we stand secure, knowing that your sacrifice gives us hope and can bring us life and healing. God, we pray for that to always be on our hearts and in our minds. And that we will always respond appropriately and do your will as we come to see that, realize that, and know that. God, thank you for uniting all people around the globe under this truth and under this hope. That every tribe, nation, tongue, race is all one in Christ Jesus. God, we praise you for that truth, for that good news. We worship you and praise you and remember your love and sacrifice now. And pray all this in the powerful and mighty name of Jesus. Amen. You guys can stand and take communion whenever you feel led.